I'm going to go ahead with the meeting beginning ritual. 起立,面向佛堂,参加三鞠躬,一鞠躬,三鞠躬,三鞠躬,开班一鞠躬,请坐下, please be seated. And uh, as, as usual, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you happen to be at the moment. And then welcome to yet another installation of the online Gao study group. This is a, a about my favorite thing to do during the week here. It truly is. I, I enjoy getting together with all of you. I, I enjoy sharing these random thoughts on the Tao teachings. And uh, every every now and again, it seems like I actually do somebody some good. I'm hoping to do that again this morning. And it just just makes for a, a, an excellent week all the way around. Uh, for for those of you who have uh, uh, not taken advantage of the opportunity to occasionally hop on here and express your uh, your thoughts every once in a while, if you've had any desire to do so, I can tell you that uh, that doing this from time to time does good things for you, um, and, and it always helps to have a uh, another perspective, uh, another set of opinions and, and thoughts on the on the Tao teachings. Uh, so, you know, uh, along with my shameless plug for, for Derek's excellent work, I'll put in a plug uh, to have, have anyone who's who's interested, uh, you know, hop in here and, uh, and express their thoughts sometime. This, this week, I want to express some thoughts about the perfect man. <laughs> The, uh, the the image of which is not me, <laughs> as you may have overheard before we got started officially. Uh, we were discussing the fact that uh, uh, that being vegetarian and and uh, practicing tai chi and qigong and the other things that I do to try and stay healthy have have not necessarily made me more attractive. <laughs> But for some reason, my wife still keeps me around, and, and that's the important thing. Um, so anyway, what, what's the deal with the perfect man? This phrase actually comes from a three-line uh, teaching by Chuangzi. I hesitate to call it a story because it, it, it really isn't. Um, it's more of a, an illustration, perhaps. And, and I have here for you two different renderings of, of the three lines uh, because there are some differences in, in translation and interpretation of this particular uh, of this particular teaching from Chuangzi. What it says is this: the perfect man has no self. The spiritual man has no achievement. The sage has no name, or if you prefer, the perfect man has no self, the spiritual man has no merit, the holy man has no fame. Now, the reason that I put both of these in here is because they both originate from sources that I have a great deal of respect for. I do not speak Chinese natively, and so I am not qualified to comment upon the accuracy of the particular translations, uh, but I, I, I have practiced Tai Chi for a very long time, and, and so I am somewhat qualified to comment on the credibility of the various sources. The first translation comes from the Tai Chi classics and was translated and interpreted by Dr. Yang Duing Ming, who is perhaps the, the foremost authority on the practice of, of uh, Yang-style Taiji Tran in existence today. Uh, he has uh, uh, published numerous works on, on the subject, practices that style from both a, a health and well-being and combat perspective, is extremely knowledgeable in, in uh, all of the various facets of the practice of that style of Taiji Tran, and, and I regard his his uh, teachings and thoughts on on these subjects as as being reliable and and um, straightforward and, and honest. Uh, I've never been disappointed by him yet. He's he's just as 
as good a source as one can possibly get when it comes to the, the, the practices of Taiji Tran. The second comes from the original Taoism.net website with commentary uh, by Joss Slabbert, whom I have heard Derek re refer to as and whom I regard as a, a modern Tao sage without a doubt. Uh, if you've ever had occasion to read Joss's writings uh, and thoughts on, on the Tao and on the cultivation of the Tao, um, they're just second to none. They, they really are, are quite outstanding and, and, and well worth uh, the little bit of time that's required to, to read them. I, I encourage all of you to have a, have a look at those things. And, and so as a non-speaker of Chinese and definitely one who is, is not qualified uh, to interpret the, the, the writing directly, <laughs> I'll leave it to you or, or perhaps Derek's familiar with this and can lend some, some insight uh, into the the meaning of the of the characters, perhaps, uh, but but since he's not had an opportunity, you know, to prepare, we may have to defer that for a bit. Uh, you can decide uh, which of these you like better. In the final analysis, what's really important is is what this means to us, and how it is that this particular three line teaching from Chuangzi winds up overlapping both the, the classics of Taiji Tran and the philosophy of the Tao concurrently. I, I want you to know, if, if you don't already, um, very succinctly, that the, the practice of Taiji Tran, both for health and well-being and as a, a martial science, uh, is absolutely intertwined into the philosophy of the Tao. It absolutely is, and one would would find, hopefully without surprise, that in the classics there is an entire section devoted to teachings from the Tao Te Ching and other Taoist sources, as this one, that have tremendous bearing on one's practice of Tai Chi Tran. And we've explored some of those, and we'll explore some more in the future. Just know and understand that, that when when one examines those those writings, uh, you're going to find an awful lot of Taoist philosophy in there. Taiji Tran is a, a Taoist art. It was originally divined in a Taoist temple at Wudong Mountain. And, and so that philosophy, and, and in some cases parts of the religious branch of Taoist practice, uh, find themselves interwoven into that into that practice. That's not uncommon. If uh, one were to practice the Shaolin arts, one would find a pretty healthy amount of Buddhist philosophy, Chan Buddhist philosophy, uh, interwoven into those practices as well. Um, if one goes to Japan, you can find Shinto philosophy, Zen and Buddhist philosophy in the martial practices there. So what I'm talking about is not unusual. Uh, but in, in our particular case, because we are, are seeking uh, the way to cultivate um, a smooth and joyous and, and beneficial life um, by cultivating the Tao teachings, uh, I, I think it's important to point out not only the, the parallels that exist and that we run into from time to time, but those places where multiple sets of, 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 these, of these teachings overlap in various philosophies and disciplines. Um, one of the reasons that I, that I teach Taiji Tran and not karate, for instance, which I, I could be teaching, is because this provides me with yet one additional avenue to bring the Tao teachings to, to people who might otherwise not encounter them uh, in a way that, that hopefully is uh, interesting and engaging through the practice of the discipline that, that does interest them. So let's talk about the perfect man. What's the perfect man? 
The answer to that question actually is, is not quite as simple as I make it appear in these six slides. If you go out on a street corner somewhere and ask 100 people what the perfect man is, you're, you're probably going to get 100 different answers. And if I had to guess, I'd say probably between 90 and 95 of them are, are going to have something to do with uh, physical appearance, uh, personality, success, wealth, uh, the kind of car they're driving, uh, what they do for a living, where they live, the trappings that society uh, drapes over us as indicators of, of success. Uh, a lot are going to have to do with popularity or with the acquisition of some kind of fame. Uh, it seems that we, we attach a, a lot of significance uh, to the uh, accomplishment of, of some kind of, uh, of notoriety, uh, even though it seems to me that, that fame and notoriety are, are extremely fragile and fleeting things. Somewhere in that group of 100 people, you may run into one or two that will talk about an individual of spiritual refinement and selfless action. And the folks that come up with that answer are, are on their way to discovering what the perfect man is. The other thing I want to point out before I make an awful lot of feminists angry <laughs> is, is this is the uh, uh, the literative man. This is the the man of literature and writing, and not a gender specific reference. This could just as easily have been written uh, the perfect person, and and I almost uh, altered altered this presentation uh, to that to that phraseology. Um, but I didn't want to subvert the, the translation of the original text. So I figured I could point that little tidbit out for you and, and everybody pretty much accept that. The perfect man, the perfect person, has lost the self. That is perhaps uh, the ultimate hallmark of the perfect man, the perfect person. It is that feat that we are all attempting to accomplish. The person who's lost the self is operating from a perspective of complete selflessness where their, their motives and their actions are pure even if they're not well understood by those around them. I've run into that problem from time to time, and I'm going to tell you all very honestly, I'm nowhere close to the perfect man yet. But I, I do my, my very best to operate from that perspective of, of purity in terms of my motives and my actions, because I find that that purity saves us an awful lot of stress and grief in life. Um, I, I truly. I, I truly tend to eschew the political games and uh, the maneuvering and posturing and, and um, positioning that goes on in society and business because it, it just makes me crazy. I, I've never really understood it. I really don't don't play very well, and, and I'm not very successful when I try. And so for me, it's just been... Uh, orders of magnitude more simple and, and, and a lot more productive uh, to just be myself, even though occasionally I can be a bit abrasive when I am. Um, I found people are willing to forgive me for for being me uh, a lot more readily than they're than they're willing to forgive me for trying to be somebody else. Uh, I, I don't know if that if that's a universal in application or not. But in my case, I found that it works. The perfect man has also transcended attachment and accumulation. The, the second line, where it says that the, the spiritual man has, has no achievement, um, says to me that, that this individual has made it beyond the need uh, for 
attached action, agendas, greed, desires, thoughts of gain or loss, um, the entire bundle of emotional stress and, and anguish that goes along with trying to, to scratch and claw one's way uh, to the to the top of a societal pile somewhere. Those things have lost their meaning and their luster for this individual. That once again is, is one of the traits that we are, are all attempting to perfect. The ability to get beyond the attachments and desires that we choose not to maintain. And in the case where we choose to maintain them, we realize going in that, that maintaining those desires and attachments will one day bring us suffering. And so we get rid of all the ones we can hopefully get rid of. The third line is uh, is the one that demonstrates the most significant difference in, in translation and linguistics. But when, when you come right down to the to the heart of it, the, the two lines can be interpreted in, in, in roughly the same manner. Um, the terms sage and holy man are, are in my mind, roughly equivalent at, at, uh, at, at most levels, both in for a, a high state of spiritual refinement, uh, a higher path, a higher calling, um, knowledge that's been gained through experience and, and study that, that helps these people navigate life skillfully. My, my only problem uh, in, in uh, either of those is, is that perhaps the term holy man implies a, a religious quality there that, that maybe isn't, isn't really necessary. Um, when I think of Lao Tzu, I, I don't think of a person who's uh, uh, heavily religious, per se, but rather one who is extremely skillful at living. And, and, and looking at the Tao Te Ching, I, I don't get a sense uh, of Lao Tzu's desire to describe and identify with a personified deity but rather with the natural laws of, of heaven and earth, the, the processes that make things work. Um, I'm not sure that that difference in these two translations is significant, but it, it's something you may want to think about, something that uh, may become important to you uh, if, if, uh, if that particular context is something that uh, that is is important to you. The the second thing is the difference between name and fame, right? In the first, uh, it, it says, uh, if let me back up here so you can see it as well. It says that the sage or the holy man, the sage has no name and the holy man has no fame. Okay, this is not a typo. Of, of that, I'm absolutely convinced. Once again, I can't read the specific characters, but the characters are different. And so, you know, it, it doesn't take either an artist or a rocket scientist to figure out that, that there was uh, something something different in mind there, uh, even though I don't have any idea, uh, in, in point of fact, um, what, the, what the intent was, because I can't read the characters. And heaven knows I do the best I can, but you know, I'm I'm probably probably never going to be a proficient speaker of Chinese. Uh, that, that's not likely to happen. So we're we're now faced with um, uh, a difference in terms, but the the similarity in meaning is is rather striking for this individual to be Wu Ming, nameless without a name, implies that, that, uh, that this individual is, is unnoticeable, invisible, perhaps uh, a bit of an outcast, uh, perhaps uh, uh, not so involved 
in, in the activities of, of society or social groups. And, and to be uh, fameless, to be without, uh, without fame and notoriety uh, implies the same thing, but at a somewhat different level and, and different manner. Uh, in other words, to, be, uh, to possess fame, for instance, uh, one's doing something that, that brings attention to oneself. One's uh, uh, involved in activities that, that other people notice that cause for them to know that person's name, to recognize that person's face, to, to hold that person up on that pedestal or, or to glorify that person for their accomplishments, their achievements, or whatever it is uh, that, that they're being held up there for. And to be without that implies, once again, that level of invisibility and anonymity, that obscurity uh, that is the absence uh, of that recognition. And so uh, in, in reading this, you know, my thought was that to be without, uh, without name and without fame is roughly the same because it is our society that tends to attach uh, so much significance to to both fame uh, and to image. That is, to who you are, what you are, what you do, what you have. Okay? Understand that being both fameless and nameless, either or in both conditions, can be self-imposed for a variety of reasons. In this case, the reasons are spiritual. And once again, this is a trait that we are attempting to cultivate. When, when we read through the, the verses of the Tao Te Ching, over and over and over again, Lao Tzu says, you know, to achieve results and withdraw, to do what needs doing and get out of the way, to help, to give, to render assistance, and then dodge the credit. What we do, we need to do because it's the right thing to do and because it needed doing, not because we're hoping to achieve some kind of self-aggrandizement or glorification as a result of what it was we did. Think of it this way. In business, and the company I work for is no different than any other, the sales organization is extremely competitive extremely cutthroat and very dangerous. Top performers in the sales organization in any business are, are regaled and glorified and, and celebrated and held up and, and used as an example to everybody else in the business because they produced more revenue than anybody else or they made us more money than anybody else or they saved us more money than anybody else. Next quarter, if those sales numbers drop below quota, or there's a recession, or the business hits the skids, or something else goes wrong, if that person is, is the, the convenient scapegoat for whatever the disaster of the moment is, and they stick their head up above that cubicle wall, there are 15 people waiting to shoot it off his shoulders for him. And that is not an uncommon occurrence. They say the ball rolls downhill, and it does. The taller the pedestal is, the farther you have to fall. And so to be without fame, to be without glory, to be without a, a name in that condition, right, sometimes can be a very beneficial thing. In the military, you learn very quickly, like about, oh, 20 minutes after you get to boot camp, that you do not want your drill sergeant or anybody with brass on their collar to know your name. Because if they know your name, you screwed up. And if you screwed up, you and a whole bunch of other people are going to be doing push-ups till you pass out. Not a lot of fun. And that's just two little tiny humorous examples. So what do we learn from this? Well, 
You know, <laughs> interestingly enough, once again, the process of perfection and Dow cultivation, as well as Taiji trend and light, is a process of voluntary or involuntary loss. It absolutely is. We have a choice about how we're going to respond to what we lose or give up or have taken from us. But at some point in time in our lives, we are going to lose something. I've said it's a process of voluntary loss. In my own personal life, I have chosen to unclutter my home, unclutter my heart, unclutter my life, to examine the attachments and desires that I maintain and try to make wise and worthwhile choices about the ones I keep so I know what I'm going to suffer for when the suffering comes, and it will. And the rest of it, I have chosen to let go of. I can tell you all with a great deal of confidence that there is nothing in my home other than my family that I have any anxiety whatsoever about losing. I don't worry about losing my life. Why? Because death is a natural process. I was born, I've lived, one day I'll die. I can't stop it. I'm not going to put it off any longer than, 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 than nature will permit. And worrying about it, stressing over it, doesn't help. Because I've been allowed the epiphany of realizing that there is no heaven or hell waiting on me when I pass, a lot of the anxiety that religion has imposed upon us no longer weighs on my heart. This is the process of reducing the self until only the true self remains. This is the path that I've chosen for myself to bring me, hopefully, some lifetime to a state of enlightenment so that I can quit going through the cycle of birth and death and rebirth and maybe one of these days migrate to an existence where that's no longer necessary, whatever that turns out to be. Okay. It is through the reduction of our desires for self-aggrandizement, glorification, recognition, and fame that we achieve namelessness and famelessness. And while an awful lot of people would look at that statement and think that I'm absolutely first-rate blitheringly nuts for suggesting that becoming obscure and nameless and fameless is a good thing, it is. Because once again, done for the right reason, it helps us to reduce the things in our lives that cause us grief and suffering. It helps us to purify our motives and our actions. It helps us nurture and, and, and bring the true self into emergence. It helps us to become the people we ought to be. I talk about that every Christmas and every year. I, I watch people abuse each other right, left, and center until the next Christmas when for 24 hours or so we all try to be the people we ought to be, and then we start to cycle all over again. It is the process of the accomplishment of Wu Wei, unattached action. It is the loss of merit and accumulation. And I want to say just a word about merit Oops. and achievement. The second line in, these, in, in this little three-line teaching, the spiritual man has no achievement, the spiritual man has no merit, once again can be viewed as, as being significantly different. But if we think about merit 
as being merit in the eyes of the beholder, then all of a sudden, achievement and merit come into a simultaneous focus. And this doesn't mean that we don't act, that we that we embrace the church of what's happening now and, and sit back on our haunches and wait for nature to make something happen. If we do that, we're all gonna we're all gonna starve to death. We still have to walk the path. So if, if anybody were considering <laughs> this little teaching as an excuse to do nothing or to do whatever in the heck you want because everybody knows there's no good or evil or right or wrong in the Tao teachings, this isn't it. This does not have to do with what we do so much as it does with why we do it. It is the essence of why karma hits us in the face like a brick. It isn't the what, it's the motive. We're looking for the unattached action, the loss of merit and accumulation, or if you will, the advancement, the nurturing, the growth of compassion and selflessness and pure goals, and motives. Thank you all for letting me share with you. I only have a couple of things in the summary. Okay, first of all, every single one of us is on the path to become the perfect man. Okay, Substitute person for man, take it to heart. It's only three lines, but it's the truth. And it's a powerful truth, and it's an easy to remember truth. The, the three-line verse from Fonza, you know, this serves as a, a reminder to us that the process, the process of becoming the perfect man is one of, of giving up feeding the ego and feeding appearances for nurturing the spirit. It's giving up the trappings of perfection for genuine, real, honest to goodness refinement and transformation. It's giving up the accumulation of society's accolades and trophies for a life of relative obscurity and namelessness. And to have those things is a blessing. One might think that this is an admonition towards poverty, but it's not. It's an admonition towards what is right and appropriate, towards pure motives and pure actions accomplished in the correct manner for the right reason. No more, no less. But because that's what it's about, these three little lines are remarkably powerful and very profound. I was pleasantly surprised to stumble across those within the Taiji classics. It just, just, just did my old black heart a lot of good to see that. And then when I found that Joss had commented on that same set of teachings, it just made my whole day. I've been having fun with this since Wednesday. <laughs> so thank you all awfully much for letting me share with you. And as always, I surely hope that something I said was useful for someone. Thank you so much. Uh, Bill, thank you. Um, so. You were uh, co quite correct in assuming that the, the original is not about, you know, a man, that the man, quote unquote here, is actually the universal usage, meaning, you know, mankind, meaning humanity, meaning a person uh, that could be of either gender. So as an example, the Chinese uh, for sage or, you know, holy man, is Shen uh, Ren, two characters, where the first character means divine and the second character means person. So Ren, the second character, is not gender specific, has never been gender specific. So Right, and that's the pinyin, R-E-N. It, it's, it's just people, isn't it? Or, or a person singular? Correct. It could be person or person, 
plural or people, which of course uh, will be more than one person. Yeah, so Zhen uh, itself, you would need to add a non character to it to denote male or female. So uh, a man would be Nan Ren, and a woman would be Nu Ren. So there's a qualifying character right in front of it, and literally that would be translated as, you know, the male person or the female person, but we translate it simply as man or woman. So the, so the point is, the original Chinese never was gender specific, uh, but the, the first, the initial translators from, from ancient Chinese into, into English, uh, you know, that was still back in the days when the utilization of the male pronoun was very widespread and assumed uh, to, be, uh, to be universal. Uh, in this day and age, of course, we try to, to even it out as much as possible with, uh, with uh, gender neutral uh, pronouns. Um, some translators, uh, in, in attempting to quote unquote right the wrongs or you know, be the social justice warrior, will alternate uh, between man and woman, uh, he and she, him and her, or sometimes they, they will uh, do some virtual signaling by completely switching from male to female so that you know, sages are always referred to as female and so forth. These are, these are all really bad solutions uh, that uh, only destroy the original and don't really add to uh, our actual understanding of the original process. So just my quick commentary there. Let's go ahead and do the meeting ending ritual, everybody. Chi Well done, everybody. Thank you so much.